Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn DeWire and this is the second deep dive in the series Murder at Mother Mountain. Now today's episode is all about sex, love and marriage in the early 19th century. It's an interview with Dr. Sarah Ann Buckley and it explores what arranged marriages were, whether people could fall in love in an arranged marriage and how common affairs were in the 19th century. I just want to flag at this point there's also references to domestic abuse and sexual assault in the episode as well. Now, if you haven't listened to part one and part two of Murder at Mother Mountain already, that's the episodes called Nurtured by Violence and the Crime. You really should check those out before listening to this episode. This show will have lots of spoilers for those two episodes. So I'd really recommend pausing now, listening to those shows first and then come back to this podcast. Okay, so hoping anyone trying to avoid spoilers has left by now, I can talk a little more freely. But so far in the series, we've covered lots of aspects of family life in the 19th century that might have surprised you. It certainly surprised me when I was getting into the nitty gritty of the early 19th century. Things like female abduction, the nature of marriages, the fact that people were having affairs. So in this episode, Sarah Ann Buckley, as I said, an expert in the early 19th century and family life in particular, is going to explain the wider history behind these events. Now, I began by asking Sarah Ann about Ellen and Daniel Berkeley's marriage, obviously central to the story. Now, I think the breakdown of their marriage is central to the wider murder in Murder at Mother Mountain. When exactly the marriage starts to break down is impossible to say, But I asked Sarah Ann about the age gap between the two and whether it was unusual at the time. Daniel was, after all, nearly twice Ellen's age. I think given both of their social class, it wasn't that unusual because often the male would have to, particularly with property, ensure that his sisters and other members of the family were taken care of before marrying. One of the aspects of this marriage and marriages in general at the time that I found hardest to get my head around was the fact that it was an arranged union. I asked Sarah Ann how common arranged marriages actually were at the time and this discussion took us on to what a dowry was. So by the 1750s, in common with the elite, arranged marriages are the established practice. So that's across the, the class spectrum. And for these, there would have to be a dowry system in place. And it's probably one of the reasons that there is such a, a strong patriarchal family in both rural and urban Ireland in this time in the early 19th century. So a dowry was very much a woman's uh, financial security going into a marriage. So it was some form of a a payment um, to uh, her husband or her husband-to-be from her family. And it was to ensure that she would be looked after in the marriage. Um, How the marriage ended would affect actually how much uh, of that financial security the woman controlled so if it was the case that it was a marriage settlement or or a divorce um, there may not be the full transfer of of that monies if uh, a husband passed away the widow would have her financial independence again and that that was kind of an interesting part and I suppose it leads into the position of widows in 19th century Ireland what would have made the case stronger was if children had been produced during during the marriage. So if a woman had children, she would certainly have been in a better position as well when it came to the death uh, of a husband or a marriage breakdown. Before we moved on from this, I wanted to get Sarah Ann's opinion on the general dowry system. To me, the dowry is ensuring that the patriarchal structure is is very much enforced. So um, overall, it wouldn't be a positive uh, place for me. But I suppose for some women, it meant that they did have some security. And for her family, if they had a larger dowry, they might be able to ensure a, a so-called better marriage or a marriage to a good husband. So there is some control there but the system that it enforces which is a patriarchal one um, I think has more negative effects overall. As I touched on in episode two 
The fact that Daniel and Ellen's marriage had been arranged naturally calls into question whether they loved each other. So I asked Sarah Ann whether love could exist in an arranged marriage. I was pretty surprised by her answer here. It was not as straightforward as I might have expected. Then again, love, as everyone knows, is a pretty complex emotion. I think it's complex. I think that as historians of emotion are exploring, love did exist. Some partnerships were based on love, but it was very much a case of uh, social class, power and, and a bit of luck. So in County Clare, for example, the Poor Law Inquiry informed in 1835 that a farmer's son will wait till he gets a fortune or till he settles his sisters, but the labourer can meet an acquaintance the night before at a wake or a dance and is sometimes consolidated the next morning into matrimony. So it leads us into the areas of parental power, how strong that was in different social classes. I would think Ellen had the least control over who she married and whether she was in love with them. But that doesn't mean that emotions were disregarded in in place for economics. Often emotions and economics could be taken into account. OK, so now I'm going to change tack a bit. In episode one, I referenced female abductions. Now, during the research for this series, this was one of the things that surprised me most, that it was still happening in Ireland in the 19th century. So I asked Sarah Ann about female abductions and what the purpose behind them was. So female abductions are actually quite commonplace in the 18th century and they're still taking place up to the Great Famine. And it is literally a often a group of men, um, typically from a, a lower class uh, structure, and they are abducting a woman, assaulting her and having her forcibly married. And essentially it's for economic reasons, for financial reasons. And in these cases, because the woman would have been often raped or sexually assaulted, they would have her sign her consent for marriage because she would have the stigma of this with her. So it, it's extraordinary that it occurred, but the practice, even though it's it's more narrow and the social circles and the, the places in the country it's taking place in are, are smaller around this time, it's still occurring. And we see in the courts that from around the, the beginning of the 19th century, men are being prosecuted for this, but the, the gains are, are so large that it, it's still occurring. The sexual assault would mean for most women that they, they won't marry. So that, that's, that's literally the, the threat of that is what is actually taking place. Some of these could also result in a pregnancy. Um, now the families that would have gone to the courts some of them could have taken a civil case, but because those that are committing this offence are from a, a lower class, uh, they won't have any any means for that. So it's about the financial dependence of a woman, really, in many ways. Given such practices existed, I asked Sarah Ann about violence within the marriage. I wanted to know, would Ellen have feared that this would just be part and parcel of her life after marriage? The term wife beating would have been used in the courts and in the press at the time for, for domestic violence cases. And it was a very regular occurrence in the 19th century. And uh, Liz Steiner Scott's work has shown this. I've looked at a number of uh, court records as well. But it wasn't until 1853 that the Aggravated Assaults on Women and Children Act was introduced to address this occurrence within families. And what's interesting is that very few women actually prosecuted their husbands um, under this uh, act or under this legislation. And most of them would have claimed their economic dependency, their fear of reprisals or, or also their distrust of the law. What I have seen, which I think is quite interesting, is that women often use uh, the police and use the courts as a warning to husbands. So they may bring a case and then either refuse to testify against them or ask the judge for leniency. So it's, a, it's an interesting way in which the legislation is being used, I think. But often the cases that are coming forward are cases where 
what was seen as a very private situation and violence within the home was seen as as private has come into the public sphere so either uh, someone has been injured so badly or it has been witnessed by other people so that's also the visibility of it is uh, probably important to look at as well a woman may not have expected domestic violence but she certainly would have known that it was a possibility and we see in writings uh, mentions of so-called good husbands or a, a bad husband and um, we see that there's an inference that there is the possibility of violence and an understanding that it would we would need to be tolerated for for the most part one thing I have seen in the court cases, which is quite interesting, is um, the involvement of uh, women in particularly um, murders of, of their husbands. It's obviously a small number of cases, but what they often did was uh, a plea of insanity would be taken in those instances. Um, so be it that they, they're often cases with, with poisoning or, and uh, in one case in particular, the judge was quite lenient on that woman because her husband had been violent throughout their marriage and she had children and he took that into account upon sentencing. So I think it's complicated, but um, until the legislation comes in, the ways in which domestic violence can be prosecuted are more difficult. I think probably a lot of people might be aware, but um, rape within marriage was only introduced in, in in Irish law in 1993. So the, the concept of consent within a marriage doesn't exist. A woman may find her own ways in which she resists uh, those uh, advances, but um, the law is certainly not going to support her in that regard. Through episode one and episode two, we've seen how Ellen, after her marriage, spent most of her 20s and 30s either pregnant or recovering from childbirth. This was an extremely dangerous time, as Sarah Ann now explains. For a woman of Ellen's social class, um, much of her earlier years of marriage would have involved both confinement and obviously giving birth. Um, most people were concerned and most couples and families and society in general were concerned with the, the dangers of childbirth and infant mortality, which uh, would be classed as the death of an infant up to the age of one years. Um, we wouldn't have solid statistics at this time because of how deaths and births were registered. That was more a post Great Famine uh, event. But we do know that it was extremely precarious. Um, and it certainly would have dominated Ellen's life. When it came to mortality among, it wasn't just childbirth and, and infant mortality. There was also very high mortality for children because of the prevalence of disease. And up until the middle of the 18th century, up to a third of children might not survive up to their 15th birthday. So this idea of um, life and death are really intertwined in, in the 18th and 19th century for women and for families. In our discussion, Sarah Ann detailed how Ellen would have been confined in her early pregnancies. I found this fascinating and asked Sarah Ann to explain what confinement was and why it was practiced at the time. So for Ellen, it, it very much could be uh, taking to the bed. Now, if she had had a less problematic first or second pregnancy, she may not need to to do this um, because uh, she obviously she's given birth to nine children. Um, we, we don't know if there were stillbirths there or if there were uh, other issues that she had, but she seems to have been able to carry a child, um, which meant that she may not be seen as uh, the most concerning of patients at the time. So confinement would have been Ellen lying at home in bed and and it would have been quite, I suppose, monotonous in many ways. But if she had had successful pregnancies and wasn't seen as, you know, a worrying case, then she would have had more freedom or uh, she may have been uh, more active late up to later in her pregnancy. 
As we move through our discussion, I want to get Sarah Ann's opinions on Ellen's life in the 1840s, which is central to the story. I began here by asking, do we know how women felt at the time about reaching the end of their childbearing years and if it possibly gave them a sense of freedom? Whether it is a sense of freedom, it's, it's just very difficult to know without having some record from Ellen. But surely not having to go through what would have been a fairly dangerous practice, having, having giving birth to children into your late 30s at the time, must have brought some sense of relief. I also asked Sarah Ann about Daniel at this point, who was in his 60s, and what it meant for their relationship that the fact that he was reaching the end of his life. At that point, her husband is coming very much near to near the end of his life if we're looking at the average age at which people survived. So I'm sure Ellen has some different power dynamics at that point. She's obviously, as you say, younger. She is is an attractive woman. So if she no longer is, I suppose, constrained by the fact that she she needs to give birth and she needs to ensure uh, succession, then that must have brought some sense of freedom. If their relationship had not developed into love or or to, I suppose, affection at this point, you'd think that maybe they're not having a physical relationship. So that also brings changes to the marriage at the time. Obviously central to the story is Ellen's affair with William Walsh. Sex and sex outside marriage is not something we really think about in terms of pre-famine Ireland. But Sarah Ann explains how affairs were far more common than we might imagine and how historians have found out details about these affairs. In some ways, what we know about uh, transgressive behaviour, we'll call it, which is what extramarital affairs would have been seen as, comes through um, reporting in the courts. So that might be through bigamy cases. It might be through sodomy cases. It might be through infanticide cases. But what all of them can tell us is that people are having a lot more sex outside of their own marriage than uh, perhaps we would have considered it from a 20th century perspective. And even though the results are often, you know, in the case of infanticide, it's often unwanted pregnancies. In the case of uh, bigamy, it's it's often men who have actually set up a whole other um, family. Sodomy cases are, are around a very possible desire for a same-sex relationship. So I think that we can't put a figure on it, but I'm sure there was quite a prevalent or a prevalence of extramarital affairs. The question then becomes how much gossip. So a lot of the infanticide cases were reported because of gossip in the community. So whether these uh, extramarital affairs are being discussed and and reported or whether there's actually an acceptance in the community is, is an interesting point to consider, I think. As we delved deeper into Ellen and William's affair, the issue of incest inevitably came up, given they were first cousins. I was curious as to whether the issue of them being related might not have been considered as scandalous as it is today. I think the the concept of incest, as we would uh, consider today, um, legislatively, it's it's only, it's first legislated for in 1908. So, uh, at the time that we're looking at here, it's an ecclesiastical offence. So it's certainly an offence for the church. It's certainly becoming less acceptable. Um, But in say the 17th and 18th century, there is still marriages between uh, cousins in the upper classes. So it's, it's something that's becoming less and less accepted. It obviously is legislated for in the beginning of the 20th century. Um, it also depends on how close the relationship it is. I would think a first cousin would be frowned upon at this point. And I would say that Daniel, by stating it was her cousin, um, probably felt that that would cover uh, his working there and living there. Um, and I think that point alone shows maybe the the acceptability or the fact of what was not acceptable in the community at the time. I think if you were to switch the gender roles in this case, it would have been far less scandalous. So I think what's scandalous is that Ellen appears to be the one who has 
constructed this living arrangement and um, as you it is probably seen as a serious affront to her husband's authority um, which which he he has culturally and and even legally um, in Ireland at the time were Daniel to to do this and we do know that there is certainly a lot of cases of um, you could say affairs or in some cases they were abuse of domestic servants female domestic servants in particular um, in the 19th century um, I think that that would have been far less common what is unusual is certainly that Ellen is the protagonist in this situation it's it appears the interesting thing I think about offences that are seen as as moral or as I say ecclesiastical transgressions as opposed to they have not yet been legislated for as a specific offence it doesn't mean you couldn't have um there's ways in which you could have prosecuted an incestuous relationship be it carnal knowledge of you know if it was a minor or uh, other ways but when it's actually defined as an offence um that that's kind of a turning point and uh i think as well when it comes to marriage in the 19th century it because the post great famine period we are seeing such a decline and we're seeing such later marriages it is a different landscape in some ways than than what has come before i'd like to thank sarah ann for her time there were a few points in our discussion that do contain spoilers for coming episodes, so I will put them into a later deep dive. Now, the next show in Murder at Mother Mountain is part three, The Trial, and this sees Ellen and William go before the courts. Until then, Sloan. <laughs>